do over the next 40 minutes or so is, is, is address three topics for you. I want to talk about phosphorus in general. Why do we use it? Why is it important? Are we going to run out of it? What's the future for phosphorus? Secondly, I'm going to do a case study on a trial that we ran over about 17 years where we put fertiliser inputs onto a pasture trial and we've done a complete audit of that phosphorus over this time to work out where the phosphorus goes. What's the efficiency of the phosphorus in that system? And where can we make gains to make economic gains and environmental gains for farmers? And then thirdly, in the last part of my talk, I want to come back and just talk about soil biology. What role do soil microorganisms play in driving the phosphorus cycle? So with that, let's get underway. So the importance of phosphorus. It's important because it's essential for life. It doesn't matter whether you're an animal, a plant, or a microorganism, you need phosphorus. You need it because it's the blueprint of your life. It's part of your DNA, it's part of your RNA. You need it to replicate. It's part of the energy system in, in all biological thing, uh, systems. ATP is the store of energy in all cells, and the release of the phosphate from ATP gives you energy to do things, gives plant energy, gives microorganisms energy. It's integral to membranes. So every membrane in every cell in every organism has to have phosphorus in it. And lastly, for, say, animal production, absolutely critical for teeth and bones and structural components like that. Phosphorus is actually the 11th most abundant element in the Earth's crust. But unlike elements like aluminium, sulf, um, silicon, it's very localised. Phosphorus is very rich in certain deposits, rock phosphate deposits, in uh, islands of phosphorus deposition like uh, Nauru, which was basically bird poo or bat poo. So phosphorus is very unevenly distributed, even though it's abundant in the earth. And that unevenness causes problems for agriculture, because in most of our soils, there's not enough phosphorus to sustain the level of growth that we want, and we need to put phosphorus in to achieve that. So phosphorus is limiting, in most cases, for crop and pasture production, particularly in a country like Australia. And globally, phosphorus underpins food security. After nitrogen, it's the most important nutrient for driving productivity, across the world for producing produce, whether it's grain, meat, milk. It's a key driver of food security. And there is no substitute for P. We need it. P is P. We need it in all our systems. So what are the issues for agriculture? Well, soils across the globe are generally P deficient, and that's partly because of that uh, misdistribution of phosphorus. And as ecosystems develop, they actually become more P deficient. So phosphorus in soil starts off from the formation of that soil, when it came out of the volcano, basically. That's where it got all of its phosphorus. Over time, that phosphorus depletes out of the system. Australian soils are some of the oldest and most weathered in the world, and we've got some of the most P-deficient soils in the world. The thing about agriculture, though, is it accelerates that decline in phosphorus. Agriculture puts an increased demand on phosphorus uptake by our plants, because we want a lot of growth, and we also export phosphorus in products. For every tonne of grain we take off a of soil, we take away three kilos of phosphorus. If we take hay off a grass paddock, we're taking away phosphorus. If we take meat, we take away phosphorus in bones. So agriculture actually accelerates that loss of phosphorus out of the system, and in a sustainable agricultural system, we have to replace that phosphorus. We're starting at deficient soils, but we also need to replace that phosphorus. And as you all know, and you know better than me, phosphorus is a major cost for your production. And it's an increasing cost. And I'll show you a slide to, to show that in, in a few slides' time. The other aspect, and as Phil touched on, high grades of phosphorus around the world are limited. It's a finite supply. There's a lot of talk in the media and in scientific circles at the moment are we going to run out of phosphorus? Well, eventually we will, but I don't think it's as serious as what the, the media might uh, promote at the moment. And then lastly, the efficiency of the use of this nutrient in our systems is poor, and I'll demonstrate how poor that is 
and what gains we might make in improving phosphorus use efficiency. So just to put it into a bit of a balance for Australia's annual P budget, we annually, and I will add most of these slides are in your handout, so you'll be able to pick up on, on any details you want out of the handouts. As a country, we use 482 kilotons of P per year. That's right across our industries. Around about 40% of that goes onto pastures, about 40% goes onto crops, the other 20% goes into uh, more intensive horticulture areas. We have to import 55% of that phosphorus. We are not self-sufficient in phosphorus in this country, and we import from the global market some 262 kilotons, 55% of our phosphorus needs. And agriculture is by far the biggest user of phosphorus. Agriculture uses 93% of the phosphorus in this country, 450 kilotons. In terms of the fate of that phosphorus out of the agriculture, 90 kilotons, or around 20%, 25%, goes back out of the country in the way of produce. Uh, predominantly grain, mostly to the Middle East. But the important thing about this slide is that bottom number, that 338, or nearly three quarters of the phosphorus that we put onto our systems, is still in our soils. That's a gross and major inefficiency for our phosphorus systems. And then if we think about that as a farm gate balance, we realise we only have about a 25% efficiency. That is, we are putting on four times more phosphorus into our agricultural systems than, than what we're taking off. So it's, it's an inefficiency, it's part of the system, it's difficult to combat, but ultimately as scientists and pragmatists, we want to try and improve that uh, farm gate balance. So in terms of global use, this just shows you a plot of what's gonna happen across the world between now and the year 2050. As we move from 7 billion people to feed 10 billion people over the next three decades, you can see demand for phosphorus won't go away. As part of this picture, we use around about just under 5% of the global phosphorus. And you can see that that, uh, that demand won't go away. Phosphorus will be a requirement of agricultural systems across the world as part of that food security. Will we run out? Well. I said at the start that there is a, a lot of media, a lot of scientific interest in this. The reality is that we've probably got three to 400 years supply based on known reserves today. Known reserves is the deposits of phosphorus that are economic to mine today. But on top of that, we have about six times more phosphorus that's not economic to mine today, but as the price goes up, it will become economic. If you look at those numbers, we're not going to run out of phosphorus tomorrow, but you can rest assured that the price of phosphorus will continue to increase. Probably a major, a more important issue is the local distribution of phosphorus. And if we look at the P reserves and the P resources across the globe, and if we look at P reserves, that's what's available today, 80% of it is held in Northern Africa, in Morocco and Western Sahara. Now, if we have political, geopolitical issues around supply for whatever that might be through the Middle East, that has major ramifications for the world price of phosphorus. And the P resources are also heavily concentrated in Morocco, Western Sahara. And the implication of that is, is when we have unrest and, and, and political intervention like that, it can cause major uh, shifts in the price or the cost of phosphorus that you guys need to pay. This plots the price of triple superphosphate since year 2000 to today, and you can see a steady increase. A three and a half fold increase in the cost of triple super in 15 years. That's higher than inflation, that's higher than CPI, so it's actually going up faster than, than what our uh, other indicators in the economy are. The more important aspect of this slide is that, uh, that huge spike that we saw in 2008. A 600% increase in the cost of fertiliser, largely driven by the US, and the US wanting to make a decision to go to biofuels, put all sorts of pressure on the world price of phosphorus, put the system into a tailspin, and I'm sure many of you can remember back in 2008 what happened to the price of uh, fertiliser. It has come back down, 
shows a steady increase over time, but the reality is fluctuations like this could happen again in the future. So we've got to be mindful of that. It's not just going to be a steady price of $356 a tonne uh, for super. I think that was what the price, was it, on your slide? Delivered at the farm gate. And the other point about it, it's a significant variable cost. In a farming system, in a grazing system, it will account for around about 25% of your variable in co input costs. In a cropping system, around 15 to 20% of your input costs. So this shows your stylized phosphorus cycle, plant soil, phosphorus system. Inputs over here, pea fertiliser, typically in the rates of 10 kilos, in intensive systems, perhaps 15, even 20 kilos of pea per hectare per, per year put into the system. Fertiliser can be in the form of single super, can be in the form of manures, can be in the form of rock phosphate, as we've heard from the previous speakers. We also have inputs of residues. And those residues themselves might be in the form of fertilisers, like pig manures, but they could also be excreta and return from grazing animals going back onto the pasture, but certainly the residues of the pasture or the crop itself is an important input of organic phosphorus into the system. The important thing is plants get their phosphorus from the water that is contained in the soil solution. It's a small pool of phosphorus, and I'll come back to that and show you that in a few slides. The other aspect is in soil we have inorganic phosphorus. That is phosphorus that is either by, phosphorus is a negative charged molecule and it will react with positively charged on the soil. It will absorb to the soil. And so phosphate in solution being negatively charged will bind to the soil surfaces that are positively charged. It will also react with free calcium in calcareous soils, iron and aluminium in acid soils and it will precipitate out. It will become an insoluble product. Or there is also the mineral phosphorus that started off from the bedrock that was originally in that particular soil. We also have organic pea, which is largely driven by residues that come back into the system. A variable availability, as Fiona said, in terms of the phosphorus that's in the organic pea. And we have the microbial pea. They're actually a component of the organic pea cycle. But as I'll show later in my talk, these guys here are absolutely critical in driving the phosphorus cycle. And it doesn't matter whether you're a conventional phosphorus application in superphosphate or an organic farmer with either rock phosphate or manures, these guys here are central to making phosphorus available within the system. And I'll demonstrate that to you uh, within the course of the talk. So what we can do in terms of pea balance, I said Australia wide we have a pea balance of only 25% at the farm gate. That's right across our our entire industries. It's not as good for certain industries where we can measure the input, we can measure the output, and we can develop a P balance efficiency for that particular enterprise. When we do that, and this is some work that was published uh, back by Weaver and Wong a few years ago, where they systematically reviewed phosphorus efficiency across different enterprises in, in, in Australia. And you, can, and you can see, I'll start with the cropping. On average, cropping has 48% efficiency. So that means for every 100 units of fertiliser we put in that system, 50% gets removed and 50% stays in the system. It's about half and half for cropping. For our grazing enterprises though, it's not as, not as good as that. In sheep, on average, 11%. In beef, 19%. In dairy, 29%. On average, across our grazing industries, we have a 20% efficiency in our phosphorus use. That is, every five units of P we apply as fertiliser, we only take one unit off in the form of animal or hay, bones or meat, whatever that is, and 80% of the phosphorus that we're applying is staying in the system and cycling around within the system. Understanding how that phosphorus cycle works is absolutely essential if we're going to increase the efficiency and make gains in terms of the sustainability and the economic use of our phosphorus fertilisers. I'll just take a break here and talk about kilograms per hectare, just to make sure we're on the same page. And most of you guys would know that the most convenient measure we have for fertiliser inputs is 
kilograms applied per hectare. But we can't just consider kilograms per hectare per se for the product. We need to also consider that different products have different amounts of P in them. And Fiona did a pretty good job on explaining that with her products in the earlier talk. For example, single superphosphate is 9% phosphorus. So that means for every 100 kilograms of super that we apply to a paddock, every 100 kilograms per hectare, we are effectively providing nine kilograms of phosphorus. <coughs> Triple superphosphate, 21%. So it's higher analysis phosphorus. Every 100 units of, or every 100 kilos of triple super we put on, we're providing the system with 21 kilograms of P. Rock phosphate, a little bit more variable, very source dependent, but generally ranging from eight to 15% in phosphorus. And manures, a little bit lower, 4%, but again, highly variable, particularly on how that manure has been treated, composted, concentrated, dried and processed. But it's not just the percentage of phosphorus in the product that we're using that's important. As Fiona said, it's also the availability of the product that needs to be factored. So it's a combination of availability and amount that will determine the effectiveness of a particular fertiliser that we want to use. And just by points of clarification, often you'll get a soil test in milligrams per kilogram, like the Olsen test or the Colwall test. And a milligram per kilogram translates to 13 kilograms of P per hectare over ten, a depth of 10 centimetres. So there's a simple conversion to move from milligrams of P per kilogram of soil to kilograms of P per hectare. 10 milligrams equals 13 kilograms, and that takes into account a soil depth of zero to 10 centimetres only, and it also takes into account that one centimetre cubed of soil actually weighs 1.3 grams. That's the bulk density of the soil. And I'll also point out here, because I'll come back to this when I go to soil microbiology, one hectare has 1.3 million kilograms of soil over that 0 to 10 centimetres. And, and these numbers will become relevant uh, as we get into the microbial community. So that's 1.3 million kilograms over a hectare over a slice of zero to 10 centimetres. So now that we have kilograms per hectare in our heads, we can go back to this phosphorus cycle and put some numbers on the pools that we have available to us. Our inputs, we know that, that's 10 to 30 kilograms per hectare. Most commonly for pastures, probably around 10, maybe 12, probably not more than 15. We have our outputs. And what happens when we fertilise, even though we want to fertilise the soil solution, because that's where the plant gets its phosphorus from, the reality is most of our fertiliser ends up here or in here. If we put kilograms per hectare onto these pools, we see that there's only 50 to 200 grams of phosphorus available to the crop instantaneously. A crop's gonna need 10 to 30 kilograms to grow throughout the year. So this pool of soil solution phosphorus has to be replenished multiple times over, 20, 50 times over throughout the life of that crop. And that replenishment, well, initially comes from the fertiliser, but we only put that on once a year. That replenishment comes from these pools down here. These pools of inorganic P, organic P, are very large in your soils, 100 to 400 kilograms of P per hectare, 100 in a P-deficient soil, a well-fertile soil that's had 30 or 40 years of fertiliser, perhaps around 400. But importantly, it is these banks or pools of phosphorus that drives the concentration in solution that makes it available to your plant, to make your plant grow the best you want. And central to that is, yes, there's chemical processes that allow desorption and solubilisation of phosphorus out of the inorganic pool, but in reality, it's the microbes can accelerate that process and make that phosphorus available into the system. If we talk about organic P, plants can't use organic forms of phosphorus. They can't take it up. They take up phosphate anions and phosphate anions only through their roots. So if you provide a plant with an organic form of phosphorus, it has to be mineralised by an enzyme and an enzyme cleaves off the phosphate makes it available to the plant. Where do, those where do those enzymes come from? 
predominantly from microorganisms that make this organic phosphorus available into the system. So let's do a case study now on a trial that I've been working with Richard Simpson since 1994, where we've been doing a full P audit and efficiency of phosphorus in a grazed pasture system. This is a trial on Ginandera Experiment Station, just out of Canberra. It's a clover grass based system. It does have subterranean clover, which would have been introduced 30, 40, 50 years ago. It has a phalaris base in it, so it also has introduced species. It also has some native grasses in it. In its unfertilised state over here, as you'll see on the left of the fence, it has a coal wool P test of around 10 milligrams per kilogram of soil. That would be P deficient in our mind, and that's exemplified here in the amount of grass that you can see growing on that particular plot. So 10 milligrams of coal wool, and when we started this work, we were working in Olsen, which is a very similar extract to coal wool, but the critical for Olsen is generally about half of a coal wool. So an Olsen is just a shorter extraction time, but they are quite related, an Olsen P soil test to a coal wool P test. So unfertilised, P deficient, and we have been fertilising this on an annual basis on the right hand side and you can see the productivity gain that you get by fertilisation. Uh, we have been fertilising this uh, annually and we've been stocking it at either nine sheep per hectare or 18 sheep per hectare because it's a grazing rate by fertiliser rate interaction trial. And just to look at the, the growth typical of what we do when we fertilise a pasture, our objective is to fertilise a system to reach a critical P level. And we need to be mindful of that critical P level. If we over fertilise, we're wasting money. If we under fertilise, we're also wasting money because we're putting fertiliser on, but we're not getting the best bang for our buck. So we will fertilise to get maximum pasture growth. So you need to determine, uh, often empirically, but also based on, on good site agronomist evidence, we put the fertiliser on that we get maximum yield. That's where we want to fertilise to. We can also predict that from the critical soil test, from a Colwell test or an Olsen test. And for a Colwell on this particular soil, it's around about 25 to 30 would be the critical. If you go over that, you don't get more pasture growth. Uh, if you're under that, you're still not at your maximum uh, pasture growth capacity. That critical amount of phosphorus that we apply is governed by the fact that we are growing a clover-based pasture. Clover has a higher phosphorus requirement than the grasses, but it's the clover that we want to fertilise. We want to get our fertiliser rate to match the need of the clover, and the reason is because the clover provides the nitrogen in the system. In our Australian pastures, rarely do we put nitrogen on. We rely on the legume nitrogen, and to get that legume nitrogen, to maximise the amount of legume nitrogen, we have to fertilise the phosphorus to the clover component. And this just shows you a typical response curve and some of the responses on our particular soil. OK, just to take one step back and talk about a strategy that we would use for fertilisation. When we start off with a P-deficient soil down here, our overall strategy over time is to build that fertility in that soil till we reach the critical soil P amount. Now often we have to put excessive amounts of fertiliser on in the initial years to build that fertility. I was looking at Fiona's slides and Fiona, your work is still sitting on this part of the curve somewhere. You aren't up to this maintenance phase, what we call maintenance phase, where our inputs become more in balance with our outputs in our system. So very much most Australian soils are still on this part of the curve. Soils in New Zealand, soils in Europe, soils uh, in parts of the US are more out here. In a perfect world, to be sustainable, we'd want to have one unit of P in, one unit of P out. That's, that's, that's the ultimate goal. But Australian soils are so P deficient, we could still be 30, 40, 50, 100 years off before we get to that level. And I, I would suggest that we can't even afford to get to that level in most cases. So we have an inherent inefficiency in our system built by the fact that we're starting from such a low P deficient um, level. So ideally when we're in this maintenance phase, as I said, one to one, 
but in reality, in most of our trials, and I'll demonstrate it in the Gin and Dera trial, we still have to overcome those P losses due to uh, adsorption in the soil and accumulation in the soil. And I'll put some numbers around that. But when we get to this, we do need to be mindful that we have to have the most economic rates of phosphorus where we're growing the maximum amount of pasture with minimal amounts of fertiliser inputs to get maximum profitability, but at the same time to not put us at environmental risk in terms of phosphorus runoff or erosion into our uh, waterways. Now, there's a lot of information on this graph. It's soil testing over many years, since 1994. This is Olsen P testing, where we deliberately fertilised this soil to two targets. So firstly, if I just concentrate on the blue line, that's just bobbling along every year. That is the soil P test, the Olsen P test for this particular soil at around about four milligrams of P per kilogram of soil, bobbling along each year, basically doing nothing. There's no fertiliser gone into that. In the other two situations, we made a decision to fertilise to what we considered was the optimal P concentration of that soil. We set a target to fertilise it to an Olsen of between 10 and 15. And so we had to put fertiliser applications each year adjusted to maintain that level within that band. And you can see how much it bobbles around due to seasonal influences. When you first put the fertiliser on, you'll get a big bang of phosphorus into the Olsen pool, but it will settle down each year. Secondly, and, we, and we, for that pasture, where we put the optimal amount of P on, we ran either 9 or 18 DSEs per hectare. And we deliberately, as scientists, over-fertilised the system. We wanted to find out how inefficient and what the cost was associated with over-fertilising a system. And in that case, we fertilised to 25 on the Olsen, which would be above 30 on a coal wall P test. And we maintain that generally over this 20 year period, keeping the soil at a critical level between those two bands. So if you, if you think about my earlier slide, we put very heavy rates of phosphorus in these initial years because we were trying to build fertility towards a maintenance level. And then in this period here, since 2000 to 2006, we then deliberately monitored our P inputs and outputs and where the P went in the system. Where did it end up? Did it end up in animals? Did it end up in the soil? What pools? And what is the uh, net efficiency of phosphorus that we got in what we called the P fertility maintenance phase over these six years? We measured P inputs, we measured outputs, and we measured the accumulation into different soil pools. So when we did that over that six or seven years, our average in P inputs in the P2 system were 14.6 kilos of P per hectare per year. Remember, we didn't make a decision on how much phosphorus to put on other than we wanted to fertilise to our set target for fertility that we were working on. In our P1, which was our optimum system, we put on average 9.8 kilos of P per hectare per year over this period that we called the maintenance phase. So where did the P go? So we can start to build some P budgets. I'll start simple and I'll start to build a bigger picture over a number of slides. So firstly, in our optimum P fertility system, on average over that six year period, we put in 9.8 kilos of P per hectare per year. We could measure over that six years on an annual basis, on average, 1.9 kilos of P left the plots in the form of sheep, in the form of coals, in the form of wool, uh, in the form of the weathers that we exported. Which meant that 7.9 kilos of P, uh, nearly 80% of what we're putting on, was staying in the paddock. It was accumulating in the soil. If we consider the over-fertilised system where we on average put 14.6 kilos of P into the system, we still only took off the same amount they're not significantly different. So we were growing more pasture, ah, sorry, we were putting on more fertiliser, but we weren't growing any more pasture. We weren't getting any more production off that. We were simply wasting a heck of a lot of input of phosphorus because now we're accumulating 12.6 kilos of P per hectare per year. So 
in that case we're putting on 50% more P. So at $3.50 a kilo for P inputs, if we're putting on 10 kilos of P per year, our P budget going into the system is $35 a year. Down here we're putting on $35 plus another $17. We're not growing any more pasture. We are simply wasting money by over-fertilising. It is the most simple step for adjustment in your pea efficiency not to over-fertilise. It's uneconomic and it puts you at greater environmental risk. So if you do have erosion events, if you do have uh, flow of uh, surface water into your catchments, you're moving phosphorus off the top. It, there is, you can plot the risk of over-fertilising and the potential for eutrophication go hand in hand. So, let's look at P flows in that optimally fertilised system. Now I'm dealing with the P1, optimally fertilised, 9.8 kilos of P per hectare going on per year. Where does the phosphorus go? I've simply averaged that as 10, because it uh, just makes it a bit easier. So we're putting on 10 kilos of P. We know that 7.5 of it is accumulating in the soil. We know that two kilos is going off farm in the form of sheep. And we could also show that half a kilo a year was actually getting redistributed by the sheep into camp areas, around drinking troughs, around feeding points. 7.5 was going into the soil, and that's against a backdrop in this soil of 450 kilos per hectare of pea. That 450 kilos is 60% in that organic box that I showed you, 40% of it is in the inorganic box. Over the duration of the experiment since 1994, we could show that 31% of that phosphorus that we'd built up in the soil had come from our fertiliser inputs. So one third of the phosphorus in our system was a direct result of us fertilising over that 20 years. So we can see where the phosphorus budget or balance is. But to add a few more bits to the piece, we also grow pasture and the pasture takes up phosphorus. And we could calculate on an annual basis the pasture actually consumed or took up 45 kilos of pea. So there's 45 kilos of moving from the soil into the pasture. The sheep ate half of that. They ate 20 kilos of pea. They took off two kilos and 18 kilos came back out of the sheep and back onto the pasture, mainly as excreta, very little bit in urine, but mainly in, in faecal material. So a very high percentage of that phosphorus that goes to the animal comes back into the system. In terms of the pasture we grew, it took up 45 kilos of pea throughout the entire season, but it also returned 25 kilos of pea as organic residues. The important point about this slide is that even though we're only putting on 10 kilos of pea, we actually have 45 kilos of pea running around our phosphorus cycle. It's four and a half times more than the fertiliser we put on. And just to summarise those numbers, and this is in your handout as well, this is a little bit easier to have a look at. A, a, su a summary of that uh, particular cycle. The amount of pea cycling in our systems is four to five times more than the fertiliser we're putting on an, on an annual basis. And remember, we're putting on this fertiliser to reach an optimal target of pasture growth. We're not trying to over-fertilise. So, 10 kilos of pea go on. Using various tracer methods, we could show that five kilos of that went straight into the soil. So 50% of our fertiliser that we applied virtually was instantaneously lost into the soil through those reactions of absorption. The microbes compete here because the microbes actually compete for that phosphorus and take it up and put it into their biomass. So there's a bit of competition there. And half of that phosphorus that we put on, that's the actual phosphorus that we put on, half of that actual fertiliser got into the crop or got into the pasture throughout that growing season. The other 40 kilos of pea has come from here. It's come from the soil. It's come from those pools of phosphorus, the organic pool and the inorganic pool that are driving that uptake by the plant. And then the recycling either back as residue, 25 kilos going directly back as animals, 17 and a half, 18 kilos going back, are going back into this pool of phosphorus in the soil in both organic and inorganic forms. And then we have our sheep camp and our total accumulation of phosphorus occurring in the soil. So there's a pea budget for a intensively managed but optimally fertilised pasture, in this case, carrying 
quite a high capacity of 18 DSEs per hectare in, in our particular experimental system. So I'm going to try and summarise that and what it means in terms of the phosphorus cycle and our strategic management of phosphorus in a system. We have a soil test target of 15 milligrams per kilogram. And if we use, um, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with five easy steps uh, as a guide to fertiliser uh, use, the first thing you need to do is determine your soil fertility and where you want to be. And if we're working with Olsen, and, and you can basically double that for Colwell, but if we're working with Olsen, we would say that you want to be working at an Olsen of about 15 milligrams of P per kilogram of soil. There's our critical soil test. When we have that critical soil test, we can grow pasture to its maximum capacity. So going higher than that critical test doesn't grow you any more pasture. As I showed, it's just a waste of resources, economic of dollars. So the pea cycle in an unfertilised system is sitting down here. It's ticking away. It's not providing enough phosphorus to the system to maintain that soil pea test. And if we run the system like that, yeah, we've got phosphorus cycling around in the soil. I would suggest there's probably about 20, 25 kilos of pea just ticking around there on an annual basis. It's not providing enough phosphorus to meet the critical demand of the pasture and we're not growing much pasture. We can grow much more pasture and have much more uh, efficiency in our livestock systems. As we fertilise it, we can start to build the system. We add fertiliser, the system starts to tweak up a little bit and we get more phosphorus cycling through the soil. The key to that phosphorus cycling through the soil is not just the phosphorus addition, it's also the carbon that we're generating by that phosphorus addition. Because as we put more phosphorus into the system, yes, more phosphorus is turning over, but we're growing more pasture, there's more carbon coming back into the system. And if you're a microorganism, the one thing that determines your capability is the carbon that comes back into the system. That's what drives you, that's their food. And if they don't get carbon in the system, they won't be tweaking around here much at all, irrespective of how much phosphorus is there, but the phosphorus does two things. It's there because it, there's more of it, but it also drives more carbon coming into the system. And as we add more fertiliser, we can start to really tweak up that phosphorus cycle until we are now running the system in the budget that I showed you on our example at Jinundera, where our system is turning over sufficient phosphorus, there's enough phosphorus coming out of that phosphorus cycle, in our case 45 kilos of P per year, to drive the system so that we're driving the system at maximum phosphorus efficiency. And of course we can go too far. We can over fertilise it and we can build it up. Sure, we've got plenty of phosphorus moving through the system now, but we don't need it. We haven't actually grown any more pasture. So once again, over fertilisation, absolute no-no. So just to summarise that, going back to where I started, in an unfertilised system, small amount of pool, small turnover, probably around 20, 25 kilos per hectare per year, but we don't get much pasture growth. It's an unrealised potential for pasture growth. We can grow more pasture, we can carry more stock, we can make more dollars off our farm, we could carry more stock, and that's because we are below the critical soil P test where we want to be. I showed you where we were in over-fertilised. We're over the soil test, we're running the system too hard, there's too much phosphorus in the system, we don't need it, we're not growing more pasture. This is where we want to be, where the P cycle is in balance with our production objectives in terms of productivity of the pasture and our animal uh, carrying capacity. So we've got the critical soil test at the right level, we've got maximum pasture production occurring because we're on that critical point on our curve and we can have maximum carrying for our stock and we're at least risk for environmental damage but we're at maximum point for economic return. Okay, so now in the last 10 minutes I want to talk about soil biology. Why are they important? And that's because these fellas here are actually the drivers for that wheel that was going around. They're the ones that make that 45 kilos of pea happen in our optimi optimally fertilised system. They also make the 25 kilos happen in our, our lowly fertilised system. It's the cycling of phosphorus through the microbial biomass 
that is critically important for making it the pasture that it is and the carrying capacity that it can hold. Why are microbes important? Well, firstly, they hold somewhere between 10 and 30 kilos of pea per hectare themselves. They hold as much phosphorus in that below ground biomass of microorganisms as you'd find in the pasture itself. And often they exceed that. So they have a great reservoir of phosphorus. And microorganisms have growth spans of oh, four days, 20 days, whatever it is. And as they turn over as a community, they actually release that phosphorus. And that's why we get a continuous of, of supply of phosphorus from the system towards our plants. But it's not just the microbial biomass. They also have little tricks up their sleeve to go and get phosphorus, because they want phosphorus out of the soil just as much as our plants do. They have mechanisms to solubilise inorganic phosphorus and mobilise it. They have mechanisms to mineralise the organic phosphorus. So when you put this cycle together, these guys here are the ones that allow phosphorus to continually be maintained in the soil solution to meet that critical requirement we need for plant uptake. So they're absolutely critically important to the system. As I said, they are primarily driven by carbon inputs. That's their food. And the carbon inputs come from plant residues, so uneaten pasture that is returned to the soil. Roots themselves, as they die, decay, get sloughed off and turned over, or from root exudates. Some 40% of carbon that is fixed by a plant goes below ground, and around about 10% of that carbon actually comes out of the roots to feed the soil microorganisms. Plants know what soil microorganisms do in the soil, and they feed the microorganisms to actually do it for them. So carbon is the main driver, also dependent on moisture and temperature. So a soil microorganism can only work when the soil is moist, they don't like dry conditions, and they also like favourable temperatures. So winter, they definitely slow down a little bit. In spring, they're away. They love warm, moist soils with plenty of carbon flow. They also require other nutrients. They require nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur. But that needs to be put in balance of their need for carbon as well. So they will go and get nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur when they've got carbon. So if they've got carbon and they need phosphorus, what do they do? They go and solubilise some of this or they mineralise some of that. That's why they can make the phosphorus cycle happen. And in amongst that, it is a highly level, high level of diversity and complexity within that microbial population. And it's only in the last 10 or 15, 20 years that we've really started as scientists to get a handle on how complex that community is. And this is what is below ground. This is what is, comprises that microbial community that drives the phosphorus cycle. It's diverse in size, it's diverse in numbers, it's diverse in functionality. We go from the micron scale, where we need an electron microscope to see what's there, to the normal microscope, to the eye. We go from micrometer scale to the centimetre scale, and it's a complex array of organisms that at the smallest end here are archaea and bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, macroorganisms, worms and insects. It's a whole community. It's a food web. It's a whole community that interacts with each other to make it happen in the soil. Bacteria actually don't do it by themselves. Bacteria do the primary degradation of organic residues, but it's as you move up through the food chain that makes that nutrient available. It's a bit like life in the ocean is, is probably the best example that I can use. At this very end, we have plankton, we have microalgae, which is actually the food source for the entire ocean. That's consumed by this, which is consumed by that, and then you've got the krill, then you've got the little fish, the big fish, and then you've got the sharks at the other end. Well, the sharks wouldn't survive without the microalgae at the other end through the food chain. It is a complex network, and if you intervene and take out one step in that food web, you can disrupt the whole thing. So if you take the krill out, then the system will fall apart. So it's a fine balance of the way these organisms interact to make a soil function and behave as we know a soil does. And that's called the soil food web, where the prime input for the soil food web is soil carbon, is carbon, plant carbon. 
either as residues, roots or root exudates, forming organic matter. That organic matter drives the fungi, the bacteria. They get fed on by nematodes and protozoa and they get eaten by this and they get eaten by that. We have a full network that allows the soil to be healthy and to function in a way we want it to. And this happens in a conventionally fertilised system equally as well as it does in an organic fertilised system. It's a fundamental aspect of soil function. Food web driven by organic matter inputs, that's what drives the nutrient availability. Plants are the primary source of the carbon and fertilisers drive that carbon. So it's a, a full circle that you need the fertiliser to drive the plant, to grow the plant, to make the carbon, to make the system self-sustainable. So, what I now want to do, oh, and just talk about some of the beneficials of microbial functions in soils. They undertake a whole range of activities, not just nutrient cycling and carbon dynamics that we're talking about today. They can promote plant growth, they can stimulate roots, they're important for aggregation and stability of the soil, soil structure. They mobilise nutrients like phosphorus, they can solubilise phosphorus, mineralise phosphorus. If you're a, a mycorrhizal fungi, you can form an association with the root and improve the ability of the root to be able to capture phosphorus, particularly under low P conditions. We have symbionts, endophytes, rhizobia, classic symbiont, forms association with the roots to form nodules to fix nitrogen. Microorganisms, when they're in a healthy state and we have a healthy soil, can suppress root pathogens. It's part of that network that creates a healthy soil. I now just want to just do some, have an explore of what we find in a kilogram of soil. Now I don't get out to the field much because I'm in the lab a lot of the time, but I did go to the field this morning and I dug up one kilogram of soil. It's always good for me to get to the field, that's about as best I get these days. But there is one kilogram of soil, okay? What is in that? Well, in that bag, in that one kilogram of soil, we would expect to find 1,000 billion bacteria. That's 10 to the 12 bacteria, just in that bag alone. That's how complex and, and diverse our soils are. 10 to the 12 bacteria, 1,000 billion bacteria in there. There's something like 10 kilometres, I'm not even sure it's 10, I get frightened to say this. I'll say one kilometre anyway. There's at least one kilometre of fungal hyphae in there as well. Network of fungi, how they join. And if you have a look across there, we can see what we would expect to find in a kilogram of soil. 1,000 billion bacteria, similar numbers of fungi, protozoa, nematodes, a whole range of macroorganisms, and up to the worms, maybe one, maybe 10 worms per kilogram of soil. If we put a value on that, oh, before I do that, we can also think about what's in a teaspoon of soil, because this is probably a little bit easier to, to visualise. A teaspoon weighs five grams. So if we take a fifth of a teaspoon, which is not much soil, what is in one fifth of a teaspoon? Well, now we only have one billion bacteria in our one-fifth of a, a teaspoon. We have 10,000 different species of bacteria in that one-fifth of a teaspoon. Remarkable level of diversity. That's 10,000 species. This has only been revolutionised by our ability to do high-throughput DNA sequencing that we now do routinely on soils. But that level of diversity is just unfathomable before we had this type of capability. And yet, historically, we've only ever cultured, characterised, known about the functions or the identity of less than 5% of those 10,000 species. So it's a whole new world that we're starting to unravel. And within that one-fifth of the teaspoon, we have 10 metres of fungal hyphae. So it's an incredibly complex and detailed world that lives within the soil. To put that in terms of uh, context of below ground living biomass, we can then equate what we find in the soil on a per square metre. If you could visualise that, a square metre of pasture has 300 grams of living biomass in the soil. If we extrapolate up to a hectare, that's three tonnes of biomass below the soil that's functioning to drive the phosphorus cycle, like I said. <coughs> 
that's equivalent to 30 sheep per hectare. So I don't know what your carrying capacity is, but below ground, you're carrying the equivalent of 30 sheep below the ground in terms of microbial biomass. And that's the collective biomass of those organisms, bacteria, fungi, right through to the earthworms. It's an incredible world. That living biomass below the ground accounts for around about 2 to 3 per cent of the total carbon in the soil. And as I said before, that living biomass contains more nutrients in the microbial biomass than what you find in the above ground crop. So managing it and understanding it, and as I showed you in the example where we optimally fertilised a pasture, we could show that that biomass delivers four or five times more fertiliser in terms of phosphorus than what we put on our 10 kilos of P per hectare per year. But the reason we put the 10 kilos is on is to keep the system tweaking it away at a level where we want to. If we're growing gum trees and productivity is not that important to us, sure, we can run on a soil at five milligrams of olsen and that system will stay in equilibrium for hundreds of years because the microbes will turn that phosphorus over to meet the demand of the eucalypt tree. If we want agriculture with high productivity, high demand crops, high takeoff in terms of animals or produce or grain, we need to tweak that system up and drive it harder with carbon and phosphorus and that's why we put the fertiliser on so that we can run 40 or 50 kilos through that phosphorus cycle rather than 20 or 25 kilos that might happen in a native system. Now, just very quickly, genetic diversity of bacteria in Australian soils. A lot of detail here, but the point that I want to make to you here is that I said that in every gram of soil, we have 10,000 different bacterial species. Species, that is, in every gram. This is five soils from across Australia. Very diverse soils, very diverse locations. We have a mallee sand here. We have a red brown earth from Gaylong a calcareous soil on the Air Peninsula and a vertisol from up north, a black soil. These soils are remarkably different in their location, in their productive capacity and in their soil type, in, their, in terms of their characteristics. Yet, they are actually quite similar in the diversity of microorganisms that they harbour. And these pie charts just show you the 10 major phyla of bacteria this is sort of a bit like stamp collecting to a taxonomist, to a soil biologist. But within each of these phyla, remember there's a thousand species as well, because there's 10,000 species, 10 phyla, a thousand species per phyla. I am just showing you data from the highest level because to get down to the species level, uh, the hall's probably not big enough to, to tell you the truth. But five contrasting soils, five contrasting locations, and yet the diversity of organisms is remarkably similar. And this diversity in soils in our microbial populations is similar whether we look at a soil in Australia, America, or Europe. It's remarkably uniform. And the point that I want to make is that soils already have within them the innate capacity through its microorganisms to carry out the functions that we want. And if one organism can't do it, you can rest assured there's hundreds that can. There is a lot of functional sharing in processes within those species of bacteria. So it's, it's a diverse, complex collection of organisms, but they complementary to each other in the ecosystem services they provide, whether that's nutrient cycling, disease suppression, or whatever we want to talk about. And we have been interested then to see what effect fertilisers have on this community diversity and functionality. And that Wallaroo trial that, at Ginandera that, uh, that I described to you, some years ago we also looked at community diversity in response to the application of fertilisers. And although we could clearly show that superphosphate on those pastures had a measurable effect on microbial community structure, so we changed those pie charts a little bit, the reality was that there was no overall impact on their functional capacity. So the soils could still do the same things. It's because, well, basically, there's more than one way to string a cat. String a cat? Uh, whatever. Skin a cat. String a cat. And that's because of this 
uh, multifunctional capacity of soil communities and how they interact within the soil food web. Presently, we are using these skills and these techniques to actually go into the trials that Fiona and Phil explained to look at what effect are alternative fertilisers or microbial products having on the below ground community, what effect is it having on diversity, what effect is it having on the functional capacity of those soils. And that's work that uh, I'll be working with Fiona over the next two years uh, and hopefully when we, when we talk again we might have some answers to, to be able to describe that to you. So in my very last slide, I'd just like to just give you some take home messages about how we manage below ground biota for above ground benefit. I hope that I've demonstrated to you the role that the soil community does play in an important process like phosphorus availability. It's the, it's the community below the ground that drives the system, not so much what we put on, it's more how the community responds and makes that phosphorus available. Soil biological function is critical for sustainable agriculture. It, it, I, I cannot stress that enough. We have to maintain those soil microbial communities or our soils will stop living. It's a living soil. Managing soil fertility is critical for optimal and sustainable production. So if we want maximum production in our pastures, we have to fertilise to that critical level of phosphorus, which is the, the most limiting after you take nitrogen out, which comes through the legume, and we need to manage that fertility to get that right. And that then provides the carbon to drive the system and the system then becomes self-sustainable over time. Nutrient cycling, as I showed, is mediated by microorganisms and the process is identical in conventional or organic systems. There is not much difference that happens below ground. The microorganisms don't really care whether they get their phosphorus from manure, super, rock phosphate. They have more trouble getting it from rock phosphate than the other sources but they don't care, they're not fussy, they just want the phosphorus irrespective of how you provide it. Microbial communities in soil are diverse, they're highly multifunctional and they're highly resilient. We can make a lot of perturbation to the system and the microorganisms all, in most cases will bounce back. And the best example I can give you that is a, a drought. You will drive down microbial numbers by several orders of magnitude in terms of number and biomass in response to drought. What happens when the soil re-wets up? The system clicks back into gear. These organisms are remarkably resilient and it doesn't matter in many cases what we throw at them. They've got a job to do and that's to live and eat carbon and cycle nutrients and make the system happen. And lastly, carbon input is the key driver for microbial function. We can never forget that. We need moisture, we need temperature, and then the microbes need sufficient inorganic nutrients as well. I could give you another seminar. When we don't put phosphorus and nitrogen onto the system, the microbes will start chewing up the organic matter in the soil, and they'll start ripping nitrogen and phosphorus and sulphur out of the organic matter, and we actually start to go into a tailspin and decrease our soil organic matter if they haven't got sufficient free nutrients to be able to meet their appetite to meet their carbon demand. So we have to keep the system in balance. And if we don't keep it in balance, we will not be sustainable, we will not be economic, and that's probably the most important thing to be, is economic and sustainable over time. So with that, I'll just um, thank in particular Richard Simpson, who I've worked with for the last 20 years on that uh, Waller Wallaroo phosphorus trial. And as I said, I stole some of his slides for today's presentation. So thank you for your attention.